Here we go. First off, that's a B. It, it's really cool. Um, <laughs> let's actually do full screen. That would be great. Nice. OK, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so this talk is called uh, Markup for the Statically Typed. Um, and I'm Matthew Griffith. Uh, and kind of exciting, I actually just moved from Cornell Tech, and now I'm writing Elm code 100% of the time at Blissfully, which is super awesome. Um, go check us out if you want to check it out. Uh, it does uh, kind of SaaS management for like onboarding uh, people um, and managing their services they need. Uh, but this is really about Elm markup. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about is I'm going to be talking about version 3, which is not out yet. Uh, so if you like look through this stuff and go out to the package and then try to do the thing and you're like, where is the feature? It's like, it's, it's coming, it's coming. Um, but uh, hopefully you'll see that it's, it's, it'll be worth it. So in building an Elm markup library, I would frequently get uh, kind of this interaction where I'm like, I'm writing like a new markup language in, in Elm. And they were like, yeah, I saw you were doing that, but you know, like why? Like, um, and uh, so I kind of want to go into my journey. What was my journey actually to sort of uh, get where I got? And uh, it kind of came down to three practical problems I had. Um, I really wanted to write some documentation for Elm UI that was interactive. Uh, there was only so much I could do on the actual documentation website. And I wanted to make these uh, kind of interactive widgets that you could actually mess around with. And maybe you would like manipulate some code and also show you kind of the result. Um, and uh, I'm like, OK, well, you know, I, I, oh, I could write some markdown. Um, but I, I want like a view function in the middle. And OK, well, that's weird. And then you know, life kind of went on. I'm like, oh, well, I, I really do want to write some articles, too. And I want to you know, put some, again, some interactive content sort of in the middle. Um, and I'm like, OK, well, I'm running into this problem again. And then there, this other thing came up. My plan for this year is to actually uh, do some video game development. And I'm really excited about uh, kind of like writing the narrative for video games. And I was like, oh, well. Again, Markdown would be great, but if you're writing narrative for a video game, it is uh, classically you need to intermingle data with your prose. Um, and so you have a lot of these solutions that are out there that are more uh, graphical. They're like whole systems. And there are some languages that have very specific semantics around this. And I was like, OK, this all feels kind of weird. Um, and so the challenges I was running into in each of these is, uh, again, I wanted to insert a view function in the middle of my document, an arbitrary view function, not just a static view function, but something I could actually, like, it could, like, look at my model, and it could, like, do a little thing. And, um, and it's like, that would be great. Why is this kind of so difficult? And I was already using Elm UI, because if I wasn't, that would be kind of absurd. And so I didn't want to write CSS. Um, I was like, I just don't feel good if I have to like, OK, I, I built this whole thing where I never have to use CSS again, except when I have to write my markdown, I need to write, I mean, it's just a little bit of CSS, but you know, well, but you know, I didn't want to kind of go there. And again, with the narrative uh, video game, I wanted to embed arbitrary data. It wasn't about HTML in a lot of these cases. It may eventually become HTML, but it could be a lot of different things. Um, and the last one is really important because it should be convenient for my girlfriend to write. Uh, in the narrative game, my plan is that uh, her and I would actually write these stories together. So she's not a programmer. She's a writer. So um, great. Like, uh, are any of the solutions I had before, like, do they meet that criteria? And that actually became kind of a guiding light for a lot of this stuff. So I had a lot of almost solutions, a lot of things where it's, and actually talking with different people, people have kind of like uh, the solution they figured out to kind of any number of things that we mentioned up there. It's like, okay, I have the thing, like, uh, you know, it, it just like, you know, grabs the markdown, it like does some substitution, like some pre-processing, and then like I make it, I make, I make it work. Um, and I wasn't really satisfied with almost solutions. I really, I really wanted something that was just like it felt, nice and uh, would be a tool that I could really build on. Um, and so I went on this journey. And this journey sort of started with, well, uh, what is markup? 
And I ran into this kind of initial problem where I'm like, what's the difference between markup and just data serialization? Um, and I didn't really have, I'm like, okay, well, I don't, I don't think there's a difference. I think we, we have two terms, right? Um, interesting, interestingly enough, YAML seems to have like an issue with this or the same like confusion because it's like uh, yet another markup language was the original uh, like, like, uh, like acronym, that's what that meant. And then they actually changed it to YAML ain't a markup language. So I'm like, okay, well, I think we're on the same page that we just don't know what's going on, so that's great. Um, so what I really thought about is like, okay, well, markup is about writing data. Cool. Well, uh, how would we write some data? And I kind of like started to like think like, okay, well, if I'm writing data, if I'm in the headspace of data, I would like some types. I would like to actually know the shape of the data. Uh, but I would also, like, I want to write prose. I'm not sure if everybody can see this. It says, easy to write prose down here. <laughs> um, or another way to say it is, like, easy to write a novel. Would you want to write a novel in it? Um, so you probably wouldn't want to write a novel in protobuf. Um, you know, J no, not JSON. YAML, you might, maybe you want to write it, like, more in YAML than JSON. Um, and Elm, I felt like, was kind of, it's like, okay, well, I've definitely written content in Elm for blog posts and everything where it's just like string literals or whatever. So I'm like, okay, that seems like obviously more types, but like similar maybe to like writing YAML. And then it's like, okay, you know, Markdown and ASCII doc and there's, there's like so many of these things, it's absurd. Um, and I'm like, well, isn't there something there? Like what about over there? Um, and it was kind of like this question of like, what would an Elm-like markup look like? Um, well, the first requirement is, is it's got to have like a lightweight sy syntax. Uh, we can't, ha like I want to be able to write a novel in this. I don't want to be in here and like uh, just really trying to figure out, okay, what's the nesting, what's whatever. And it would have types. And specifically, like with types, why do we want types? Because we have to work a little bit to get them. Uh, and they allow human computer collaboration. Uh, that's, they, they have a, we have a similar language, we can both talk, and we can actually like, uh, figure out what uh, we're gonna do about creating this content we wanna create together. And we know this, like in Elm, we have this lovely like, collaboration with the compiler. You know, you're like, I wanna do this. The compiler's like, that doesn't make any sense. And you're like, oh yeah, you're right. It's great. And it would be specifically about writing data. Could we do that well, where you're writing data? So, what is the, where did I actually land? If that was kind of like my guiding light, uh, what does the language actually look like? So, this is the language. Um, this contains nearly every uh, con constructor in the language, uh, every special like case. Um, you know, we got an image down here, we got a header. And you may think like, well, I, it's not just all about headers and images, which we'll get to that. You know, we got some bold text, Oslo Elm Day, and cat is a t italicized. I really like the idea of like representing like what it looks like physically. You know, so it's like italicized. Um, and I wanted like unambiguous syntax. And this is because me, I, I've shipped multiple versions of my documentation for Elm UI. Uh, with Markdown that was rendering not how I wanted it. And it was because I was kind of too lazy to sort of check the visual. It's like, oh, I was indented too far. So that for, therefore, I'm like, I'm not a list. I'm a code block. Great. But I'm already published. So I'm, am I going to publish a patch version to actually fix that? Well, no. I'm just going to feel bad about it. Um, so everything is unambiguous. You have a, a human name at the top of this stuff. No block is also hard coded. We'll see header. There's no special thing about header. It's actually a block that's named header, and we'll see how to name those later. Limited special characters. Uh, some of these markup languages, when they extend, uh, there, there are some really interesting ones, like there's one called ink, which is specifically for narrative, uh, like creating a narrative uh, structure in your game, right? And so it's got all these like crazy like characters that mean stuff, and these people are in, like, They've done the narrative game design stuff. So they know kind of the concerns, 
But you come into it, and you're just like, oh my god, like what, what's happening? There's so many characters on here, and there's going to be a lot of learning to actually figure out what's going on. So these are the special characters. Um, and for arbitrary inline stuff, we have uh, essentially like an inline ability to attach certain attributes. And again, these are all it's arbitrary data attached to you know, a range of text. So the definition, if we want types, we need to inform the compiler, which is basically what I ended up writing, um, what it should be expecting. So how would we do this? Well, uh, this is like an example of the language. And this is slightly simplified. We'll get into that in a moment. But you know, we have a document. And that document should be rendered as an HTML article. That would be great. And the document is composed of many of text and images. And we say, well, text is just some text. But here is an image. It's a record of two things. And these are the things. Great. And it's very obvious to see that this is just a mapping from one to the other. And also, that we don't just have to have HTML. We could, it could be any data, anything you absolutely wanted. And we can also do things like we can add additional constraints uh, to our document. So we can say, this thing is an integer between whatever and whatever. That's cool. And we can also say, oh, you know, this document or this thing starts with a record, and then I want a bunch of like paragraphs. So this is a classic example for, uh, you know, I want to create this blog, and I want my front matter at the front. And it's required. It has to be there. But if we have types, we have error messages. Now, I actually have kind of wondered if like this fact is why as far as I know, there is not a like, lightweight markup language with types on the level of Elm. Um, and it's because it's like, oh, well, if we have types, uh, that, it'll break my flow. You know, I'll be writing. I'll run into a type error, and then everything is broken. And then, you, you know. And so what would these, actually, these error messages look like? Well, fortunately, I have some pretty good guidance on that. And um, this is actually an error message from the Elm markup compiler, uh, formatted to look familiar. <laughs> um, and it, it'll actually like figure out exactly what's going on. There are a lot of different error messages that can give. And they're all, hopefully, pretty intuitive. Um, but that's actually not enough. Uh, if we just got these errors, um, you can imagine if you have an error, we really want to, again, we're writing data. You, writing is in like you are sitting down to write your novel. And, uh, but your novel is in data. So we need additional ways to actually handle errors. So here's kind of an expanded version of what we just saw before. Um, mark record actually doesn't take just the view function. Or really, this is, it, it turns it into, it doesn't just turn into HTML. Uh, but it also has this idea of converting, if there is an error in this block, do this content. So you still, at the high level, have the ability to you know, know, oh, this is a successful, totally valid document. But this allows you to actually make things sort of dynamic, um, which, again, we're getting back into this collaboration idea with the computer. So with Elm Markup, there's kind of one final piece. It started out as a parser, where it would just like parse some stuff, and then you have the thing, and great, it's done. Um, and then I said, like, I got to go nuts. Um, and instead, I was like, well, we have to have this intermediate step so that we can do all these other cool things. So we have a string. Great. We can parse it. Then we get an AST. It's called mark.description. And once we have this AST, which we can store in our model, we can then convert it to our result. It's just a generalized data structure, the mark.description. We can convert it to our result at any time. And our result can actually emit error edit messages to edit the AST. And the AST, in turn, can actually two-string itself back into the code. You may notice this looks like a conversation. That's convenient. So demo time. Man, OK, how do I get this thing out there? Perfect. Oh, man, is Flux on? Or is that just? No, we're good. So 
this is an editor. Uh, this is basically just an Elm program. Um, the cool thing about it is that the model is just that mark.description. We also uh, capture the source text, the string um, of our document, which is on the left. And we also like track, I think, one Boolean and one other thing. But it's mostly just the document. So what do we get from having this document? Well, you can see the document's rendered under here. Like, it's partially rendered. We know this is an image. There's something wrong with it. So it's just like, hey, this is, this is broken at the moment. But we can kind of see everything else in case we need that. We have these two uh, error messages. So if we go over here and we correct that, it's like, OK, well, that's good. And then we want to align this uh, image, not align alert, but align left. That would be fantastic. OK. Um, and we need to be able, oh, we have an int out of range between 30 and 80, 800. And we have a width of 20. So it's like, OK, well, um, great. So we have that. It's like, OK, well, we, we now have a valid document. These are my two cats. They're awesome. That's Bardo. That's Phoebe. Um, it's like, OK, well, we actually have this, this issue here. This is like, welcome to Elm Marker. It's like, well, could we just do that? And you can see, actually, it connects over here. In fact, we can say, like, we're actually pretty excited about this. Um, <laughs> thank you. But c can, we, can, we go, um, can we go even farther? So what I did here, you might have seen in the corner, it now says editable. That's the Boolean that we're storing. Um, all it's doing here is that because, oh, we're also storing the cursor position on the actual text. So when we highlight different things, you can see it knows where it is. And we actually have some controls. So that feels pretty good. But uh, how much farther could we take it? Um, so this is just this is like my cheating, right? Like I'm able to add some stuff. So we have a new component called draw. It's like, OK, well, we have this record of uh, you know, three fields. We have a width and a height. And we, have, we want some circles. Now, I could have made like a very like, elaborate uh, like actually drawing mechanic. All this does is draw circles. But, um, but it does draw circles. And we can change this to, or where did it go? You know, everything's modifiable. So that's great. Where are my slides going? <laughs> um, so that's kind of where we landed, or I landed. Um, the results, everything's fully typed. We have this ability to be fully typed, but not just like throw everything out the water or out the out the window um, when uh, like there's something wrong. We can actually increment incrementally fix stuff. Um, it's easy to make fragment errors so, or editors. So a fragment editor is basically like, oh, I know I have an image here. And in order to like modify this field of this image, I can send a mark.update float with a special opaque ID that represents that float and whatever I want it to be. And then the actual AST will figure out what needs to change. This is actually very convenient for my girlfriend to write. Like it's able to actually set something up where she can modify the text or even build a tool that she could use to actually have this lovely like collaboration um, experience. And there's potential for the future. There's, um, you know, we can have automatic semantic versioning. Kind of the entire uh, realm that we're familiar with in Elm all of a sudden becomes just available. Uh, it's just like sort of free. It's sort of just like, oh, it's there, great. Um, uh, just in markup for writing your content. We can have an L markup format. This is literally like one function. We already have uh, this description of what we should be. It's a very simple syntax. There aren't many edge cases, hardly at all. So writing that, I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Making a code editor integration is actually pretty easy. Like we just like hawk that data outside of Elm through a port and then do whatever kind of transformation we want to do. And then having CLI uh, like support is kind of naturally, that's what you'd want with that. And 
that's it. Thanks. Um, thanks for all the organizers. And um, yeah, I'm Matt Griffith.